These are very famous um, quotations from the scriptures. Both of them, suffer little children to come unto me, is um, often, very often quoted, and for very good reason. Um, there's a story that I tell about Swami Kriyananda, who's the founder of Ananda. He has an Indian name, but he's an American man. Um, he was a direct disciple of Paramhansa Yogananda, and he lived with Yogananda from 1948 till Yogananda's passing in 1952. Um, and he's still living, he's 85. In fact, just as a piece of news, um, Swami wrote a book some 30 years ago called Education for Life, which is the foundation of the school that we have here, Living Wisdom School. It was just translated into Italian, and they had a launch of that book in Rome uh, last night in Italy. 700 people came. Um, and he had, Swami wrote, he had three standing ovations. <laughs> And then the next day, on Sunday morning, they had a roundtable discussion for about 100 people. 100 people came, and there's just a tremendous enthusiasm for um, bringing uh, this style of education into Italy. Um, God knows they need it. <laughs> I was saying that there's probably a lot of uh, souls in the astral world who know they're destined to be born in Italy who are weeping tears of relief. <laughs> <laughs> to know they won't have to go to what Helen called those medieval Italian schools. Very rigid, very unchild friendly. So it's very good news. Italy is just about the right size of a country to be able to create a small revolution, which is, uh, Italy has been the, the source of a tremendous number of innovations over the course of world history. And Swami Kriyananda and Ananda are very well known and I respect it there. So this is very good news. You know, everywhere we are in the world today, we see nothing but change. Everywhere we look, everything is changing. I, I'm uh, remembering, my David used to do a lot of photography uh, when we used film. <laughs> and we had a very nice relationship with this uh, company on University Avenue here in Palo Alto that was a film developing company, and it was an Indian family, an immigrant family, and he was supporting his family by running that little shop. And you know, and who would, have, who would think? I mean, it was just a nice, solid niche he'd carved out for himself, and then digital cameras come, and just the whole industry is just, just wiped out, just like that. And everywhere we look in life these days, everything is just shifting, shifting so fast we hardly know what to do. And in fact, in conversation with our school teachers about education for life, we were just having this uh, uh, discussion, which especially as you get into junior high and high school becomes a real issue, which is what can you actually teach children that will be useful to them later? One of my friends, who's a mere 40 years old, graduated in computer science from college, did not go into that field, and now everything she learned in college is completely useless. She would have to start over altogether if she ever wanted to have a career in that field. So when you get to a certain level and you're really, even, even if your goals are just materialistic and you want to train these children to have, be able to work, what do you actually teach them? In an age that we're in, which is we are in what's known as the ascending Dwapar Yuga, there's a book now called The Yugas, which is for sale in our boutique, and I highly recommend it. I'm just finishing it myself. It's a, a detailed study of something that is mentioned in Autobiography of a Yogi and mentioned by Sri Yukteswar, which is that on this, the planetary cycles of higher and lower ages, and we are the nadir of the planet this round was 500 AD, and we've been on an upward swing since then that really became dramatic, first in 1700, then in 1900, and now we're really moving into an age of energy. Um, this is simply a planetary phenomenon, you should understand. It has nothing to do with soul liberation. Souls can be liberated at any point, with any background. It's sort of like, it's the background story to the soul's individual journey, and we are drawn from the astral world to that planet, and there are many planets to go to. As Yogananda put it, the universe is teeming with life. It's consciousness everywhere. So to imagine that we're the only planet that could get it together enough to have living human beings is, well, naive to say the least. It was one of the many things that soured me on education. 
Mrs. Burroughs, no, Mrs. Pugh was her actual name. I always, in retrospect, admire anybody with the last name of Pugh who had the courage to become an elementary school teacher. <laughs> Unfortunately, she was a lot like her name, but that's beside the point. <laughs> I'm not talking about church pews, I'm talking about the other one. <laughs> anyway, um, at a certain point in my little fourth grade or fifth grade class, she was teaching us about the conditions required to support life. And there's, I don't even, I don't remember anything I learned in school. I just held my breath until I met Swami Kriyananda. I think I exhaled at that point, and then my life started. I went, phew, at that point. Um, so she wrote up the conditions of life, and then explained to us, and they had to do with the atmosphere, and how you breathe, and stuff like that. Things, that, material conditions. She declared that these conditions only exist on planet Earth, and therefore there's no life on any other planet. This was education. I said, I mean, like, you're, I'm nine years old. It seems so obvious. Can't there be a form of life that's adopt, adapted itself to other conditions? I mean, I, I didn't know the phrase, duh, but I would have said it if I had known it. And she said, no. <laughs> I thought, you're supposed to be my teacher? I mean, like, where is your imagination? Let's give us a little break here. Well, anyway, back to this planet. We're in this period of time where everything is going up. We're in an expanded, uh, a time where consciousness is increasing, and especially what's increasing is uh, the consciousness of energy. That's why all these different developments have happened, as mas the masters explain. It's not like they weren't there before. Um, Swami Kriyananda's father was an oil geologist for SO Corporation. He went all over the world. And he went to Romania, where oil had been seeping out of the ground for generations. I mean, it wasn't like it wasn't there, it's just nobody knew what to do with it. And then when a rising sense of energy begins to come on the planet, because we're in an orbit closer to our galactic center and there's more energy coming here, it's all explained in the book. In any case, there's a consciousness of energy, so ideas occur to us. But in a time like this, where everything's shifting, everything's shifting, and it's all moving more and more toward energy, not only education, although self-evidently education, these poor children are trapped in these classrooms, uh, tortured in many of them, really, but they're trapped in these classrooms, and the idea is that we're trying to train them for their lives, for something that will be beneficial to them. And as we're moving more and more into an age of energy, the obvious ideal kind of education relates to that, relates to where we are and what we're doing. Of course, not everyone on the planet um, is even interested in reading a book about the yugas, and Dwapara Yuga will not strike all of them as true, and so that's why it's a, a bit of an uphill battle at this point. But in a time of change and a time of energy, what you obviously want to teach children is about energy and change. Isn't that so? Uh, that's a good idea, isn't it? And in fact, if we really look closely at everybody's life, forget children, forget education, that's what we're all always struggling with, isn't it? If you really think about what it is that makes success and makes failure, it's the capacity to generate energy and the capacity to cope with change. Change is the only thing that we can ever rely upon, isn't it? It's the only thing that never changes, is change. As simple as that. Speaking of parents and children, I, I remember so, so poignantly, and this may in fact be one of the reasons I've had no children in my life, the look in my father's eyes when he really realized that his little girl was gone. You know? On one hand, it's so sweet, this relationship we have between our, the parents and children. And then on the other hand, we begin to rely upon it for our happiness, don't we? And then what happens? It, it evaporates. In, in this case, nobody's ill will. It would be, in fact, exactly what a parent would want for their child, that their child would grow up and become an adult and find their way in life and do the things that are meaningful to them. And yet, such is the duality of this world that the very success that you hope for is also the uh, end of a certain kind of joy, isn't it? And then there's the other kind of change, the change that just comes brutally out of the night 
and gallops over all of our attachments and all our desires and all our self-identifications and everything that we thought we needed and here it comes. And how much of our actual education teaches us what to do? You know, we can sit down and do the worksheets again and we can answer the tests and we can follow the mold, but the mold isn't really the challenge of life. The challenge of life is that everything is always shifting. And Swamiji writes in the introduction to his book, Education for Life, he says, even if money is your goal, because he's playing to what parents and society think is the goal of education, is to build your resume. I I saw this poignant letter in the newspaper from a 13-year-old girl, Dear Santa Letters, uh, in Silicon Valley Child. She wrote, Dear Santa, I would like a little time off. She said, after all, I'm just 13. But everybody's so intent on building the resume and doing this. And I talked to a, a parent who was talking about SAT training courses, you know, whatever they, those tests that you have to take to get into college. She was talking about the necessity to have her child do these SAT training tests so that she could get a higher score so she could get into this college. I said, gee, why don't you just like have her take the test and have the test actually assess her actual accomplishments, and then she could go to an appropriate college. The mother said, now that's an interesting perspective. (laughs) Now, a lot of this is about parents and children that I'm talking about here. I was going to finish about the, uh, the introduction to Swami's book. He said, it's not so much that you want to give people the skills to earn money. What you want to help them understand is how to have the magnetism to attract money. Because you see, magnetism is energy. And it's not just money that we need to attract by our magnetism. Absolutely everything that happens to us in life is the result of the magnetism that we have. This is the growing awareness of the age of energy, where um, Einstein perceived what was always there, which is what we think of as fixed matter, is not fixed matter at all, but it's energy in various states of vibration. I've just explained to you all the science I know, but that is all the science I need to know. Those of you who want it in more detail know how to find the rest of it. But the end point of that is that we are always just acting as a field of energy, in a field of energy, and everything that happens to us is the interplay of those energies. Our very consciousness is the interplay of the the whirlpools of energy in our chakras um, and the upward moving flow of our uh, willpower, our ambition, our discipline, our focus, our aspiration, our determination, and it's always playing itself out at all times. You know, once we begin to understand that, even in the tiniest perspective, everything becomes about how we work with our energy, and what kind of magnetism we generate. That's what your karma is. That's what your luck is. That's what your good fortune, that's what your ill fortune is, is just the magnetism of your consciousness. So now we come to our scripture reading for today. Because one of the forces that is at work here is the question about really how does that magnetism work with itself? We get in tune with the idea that my magnetism is my personal power. And so we go through phases in one incarnation or for various incarnations when we realize I can generate force by my own will. And we become perhaps powerful, but we become powerful in such a way that we're using our willpower kind of against the greater force of the world. And we're analyzing, we're strategizing, and we're thinking about where we should move, and we're gathering up our forces, and we're pushing forward. But the inevitable result of that kind of magnetism may be a certain short-term gain. And in this sense, a few incarnations of success would be considered short-term gains. It's not like the karma will come back immediately. But the more you push against the world, and the more you conceive yourself as as the solitary force making it happen, the inevitable result of that thinking is also that you become concerned about who's going to push against you. And it leads to 
a sort of fear of other people's response and a, a fear of their trying to get back of you and a fear of losing your own power. And so instead of an ever-expanding happiness and freedom in your accomplishments, what we get instead is a greater and greater tension. That's why even very, very powerful or wealthy or successful people often end up very twisted by the end of their lives. Because all that assertion of myself against others leads you to be more and more twisted and small inside yourself. So we look to the real secrets of life, for the secrets of life, to those whose lives exemplify what it is that we want to become. Often when people ask me, you know, how do I find my guru? How do I know what my spiritual path is? Specifically, how do I know I belong at Ananda? Maybe I belong somewhere else. Well, a lot of things about a spiritual teaching are a little difficult to assess, especially when the, the uh, guiding spiritual energy, I point to the altar behind me. I mean, Babaji, the, the picture of the man at the top of the cross there, that's a drawing of Babaji, and Babaji is, according to Yogananda, is an ever-living master. Even in the Himalayas, he still retains, even to this day, his physical body. It's an amazing concept to consider. But nonetheless, we can't just call him up on the cell phone and have a little chat. Babaji, I was wondering about which job I should take. Will you tell me? At least not in a physical sense. Yogananda passed away from this world in 1952 and everyone else before him. Kriyananda is still living, is a powerful guide in our lives. He's 85 years old, he's not easily accessible. He lives sometimes in Europe, sometimes in India, sometimes in America. So we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily look right at the defining energies in the way that we might like to. But you can see, at least at this point, part of what uh, was presented last uh, night in Rome was not only Swami Kriyananda talking about these ideas of education for life, but Nitai, who, was the, who started the first education for life school in Ananda village in 1972, and has been doing education most of this time, he wrote a letter which was read in Italian there. He wrote it in English, and then they read it in Italian. And he described, after 40 years, you know, where are the children who were educated in this system and what has become of them? In other words, what is the fruit of this way of educating children. Because, of course, that's what every parent wants to know. It's all right if they have fun in kindergarten, but will they get into Harvard? That's the question in this area. I had a mother weep on my shoulder. She knew her child needed to go to kindergarten here, but she was so afraid that choosing this school instead of one of the others would make it more difficult for her children to get into Harvard, her child. It was serious. I had to hold her and let her cry because she really was scared. I tried to whisper into her, honey, her chances are greatly improved, but <laughs> it was still her fear and I had to face it. So for us on the spiritual path, the question is, you come into Ananda and you look at the people who practice it. You know, these people have followed this path for a really long time. Do they look like somebody I would like to be? And every ashram you go into, Every spiritual group you enter, every church you go to, you see the fruit of the practice of that teaching. And so we have to decide, is this who I really want to be? And every spiritual path has its own flow, what it's supposed to look like. And then you have to read the words of the masters and you have to try to understand what they're saying. And then you have to look around you and see what it would look like. Jesus says, suffer little children to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. You also have to ask yourself, who is truly expressing the teachings of the masters? You know, Jesus says, suffer little children to come unto me. So we go many places nowadays, 2,000 plus years later, people purport to offer the teachings of Jesus, but are they? By their fruits ye shall know them. Jesus himself answered the question elsewhere, how do I know a true prophet from a false? By the fruits, he said. A good tree gives good fruits. A bad tree gives bad fruits. And what is good and bad fruit when we're talking about human life? Well, you can measure it in lots of different ways. Recognition in the world, money, power over people. If that's what you're looking for, that's what you look for. 
and you look for a group of people who have recognition in the world and money and power over people? Or do you want peace of mind? Do you want kindness? Do you want childlike simplicity? You know, do you want joy? Do you want to look at people who look happy? I had a very interesting conversation with a young woman at Stanford University who was very powerfully drawn to this path. And I felt a strong karmic connection with her, although in the end she repudiated this path for the reasons I'm about to tell you. And she looked at me and she sort of was, was drawn and afraid simultaneously. She had almost equal uh, amounts. And her fear was that if she embraced a path like this one, all these other desires that she had would be lost to her. My fear, when I had been exactly her age, was all that I would have was all those other desires. I was just terrified that I would end up with all that stuff and no meaning. And she was afraid that if she embraced this as meaning, she would lose all that stuff. Everybody's so different. Isn't it just amazing? So she asked me the question. She said, are you happy? I said, well, you know, almost everybody you ask will say they're happy. But how, what is happiness, really? I mean, happiness can be that I'm in prison and they stop torturing me for an hour, but I wouldn't really call that happy. Some people can say they're healthy because they don't have cancer, but they can hardly get out of bed in the morning. They have no energy. These are very um, subjective questions and a little bit difficult to answer. And few people will admit that their path in life was a disaster. Almost everyone tries to defend whatever position they're in. But so she asked me that question and I thought about it a little bit longer and I said, I'm going to answer a very different question. I was a very, very idealistic young person and I have not had to compromise my ideals to live in this world. Many of my ideals have expanded and I have understood them on a deeper level. I had more political ambitions and so on when I was younger, which I've since seen in a different light. But I honestly can say I've not had to compromise. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. And, and Ananda, we say it this way, where there is dharma, there is victory, where there is right action, where there is commitment, and dharma in this sense means commitment to expanding consciousness, there will be victory. And not necessarily victory in the eyes of the world, but victory in the, in the un, eyes of what they call the unbribable judge, which is God himself. But I don't mean a judge in that sense. The unbribable judge is our own happiness. So when Jesus speaks of children uh, representing the spirit of the kingdom of heaven, what is so attractive about that? Is it because that we'll get to play on jungle gyms, you know, when we're in heaven our whole life, or make little houses out of blocks, you know, or, or have tea with our dollies? You know, that's not what we're thinking about at all. But what we see in children that is just so overwhelmingly attractive to almost everyone, and as Swamiji said, it's not just that they're small, because the, uh, the babies of all species are attractive to us, baby elephants who are still much bigger than us, are still just adorable. Because what they have is, what we would even call it this way, childlike faith. They, they enter into this world with this kind of fearless expectation. Hello world, here I am. You know, it's just like that's what children do. They spread their arms wide like that. And they rush toward whatever is going on. And they have this delighted enthusiasm for absolutely nothing, you know, just nothing. They just get so excited about it. And instead of our thinking that they're nuts, which in truth they really are, you know, <laughs> we envy it. Because the older we get, the more we begin to divide life up and more it seems so hard, the less confidence we have that it's going to work out, the more we find that we just can't keep it and hold it in line. And this is what, in the Gita, Krishna is referring to when he calls it the carping spirit. The carping spirit is always saying, this isn't going right. Those people aren't doing it well. This isn't really what I bargained for. God, I didn't want this to happen. Why have you betrayed me? I work so hard and it never comes out right for me. You know, you can hear it. It goes on and 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 on. And in fact, we're often sort of encouraged to be like that. It's considered to be astute. 
especially in America. Every country has its cultural problems. And one of the problems of Americans is that we really, we really like to be shrewd. You know, and we're very careful just to make sure that nobody takes advantage of us. <laughs> and we have a little bit of a trouble problem, more than a little, trusting our hearts. The, the life that I've lived, I've really seen it. Because many people walk into this room or many other rooms where I have stood and others like me have stood to talk to people about God and love and bliss and Ananda and Paramahansa Yogananda and Swami Kriyananda. And people are all the same. They come into this spirit among these wonderful people and there's this wonderful spirit of joy. You fill my heart with music. I dance through life with thee. Joya, joya, joya. And it's just so moving. I remember one of my dear friends who came to this church because her sister was having her baby blessed. A woman who became my dear friend, a beautiful woman. She came beautifully dressed with all this makeup. She was so moved that she just wept and wept, and her black mascara just ran down her face like this. You know, when I'm talking, I have to try to be a little impersonal, but I kept thinking, oh, you poor woman, you have no idea what you look like. You know, <laughs> like this. She, fortunately, knew how to follow her heart. And, you know, she came in and never left. But I watch so many people, they absolutely love the experience, but then they have to go out and be shrewd. <laughs> you know, looks pretty good, but who knows? <laughs> like that. And yes, we can't be, as Swamiji said, so open-minded that our brains fall out. That's not really helpful. Sri Yukteswar put it this way, spirituality is not dumbness. Saintliness is not incapacitating. But it's very different to look at life wanting to believe. You know, it, it, with the bias in favor of childlike bliss, instead of looking at life looking for the flaw. You see the difference? It's, it's all the difference in the world. Because much of the time, there really is just as much bliss as flaw, it just depends on how we want to look at it. Like Yogananda himself said, every building has a sewer system. He said, but when you go into the building, you don't say, show me the sewer. You know? You know it's there, because it has to be there. But what you look at is everything that's lovely, everything that's uplifted. This is a world of constant change and constant duality. What we become is what we concentrate on. What we see is what we are. Just as simple as that. I started this saying I would tell you the story about Swamiji, and I remember now that I never have, so I will here at the end. He had dinner with this couple, actually, as it happened in Rome. It was a couple that I also know. Very, very worldly people. Totally worldly values. Very wealthy and very sophisticated um, Italians. And it was a business association, and he went out to dinner with a friend. And the couple had a modern marriage, which is to say a horrible marriage, and uh, all based on him being handsome and rich and her being beautiful, and they were just at each other all the time. And after the dinner was over, the friend who was with Swami said, oh, I, can't, I just could hardly stand to be with them. They were just criticizing each other and on each other's case the whole dinner. And Swamiji said, they were like that. And he said, how could you not know that? It was just so obvious. And he gave all these examples. Then Swamiji thought for a moment. And he gave such a telling answer. He said, yes, of course, I saw that energy. And then he, he said, did you notice that everything I said was always trying to create harmony? Trying to help them to see each other's point of view? Trying to get them to lift their minds up to a higher level? In other words, what Swami was saying, they both saw the same thing. But Swamiji saw it only as an opportunity to lift it up, whereas the other man saw it as something to criticize and get away from. Exactly the same situation, but one felt tremendous aversion and eagerness to escape, and the other just put himself into a flow of greater and greater happiness, trying to give that happiness to ones who didn't have it. Swamiji remarked recently in a message he gave for his 63rd spiritual anniversary. He said, when I look at the world, he said, all I see is 
is, is consciousness trapped in ego, striving for freedom and for bliss. And then he said, and I feel an overwhelming love for everyone and a deep desire to help them. Wow. Childlike joy without any of the childishness. That's the consciousness of a saint and that's who all of us can be. God bless you.